Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn and John Russell. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first, an audit of Facebook's civil rights record has found serious setbacks in its efforts to deal with issues such as hate speech and misinformation. The social media company ordered the investigation two years ago to measure Facebook's performance on major social issues. The findings were released on Wednesday. The auditors reported that Facebook had taken important steps forward in building a long-term civil rights accountability structure. But they said the steps do not go far enough and should not be the end of Facebook's progress. The report says Facebook's progress could be obscured by the painful decisions the company has made that represent significant setbacks for civil rights. The audit suggests that Facebook attempt to build a civil rights infrastructure into every part of the company. The auditors expressed concern at how the company chose to deal with some Facebook posts by politicians, including U.S. President Donald Trump. One of his messages was widely criticized for giving false information about the process of voting by mail. In another post, appearing on both Facebook and Twitter, Trump used the words, any difficulty and we will assume control, but when the looting starts, the shooting starts. The second message was posted in May during protests after the death of 46-year-old George Floyd. Some of the demonstrations turned violent. Floyd died after a Minneapolis police officer held his leg on Floyd's neck for more than eight minutes. Twitter acted on both posts by Trump, saying they had violated its policies. In the first case, Twitter warned users that the claims about voting by mail had been judged to be false by investigators. In the second, Twitter hid Trump's message, saying it violated its policy against glorifying violence. Facebook did not take action against either post. Facebook chief Mark Zuckerberg defended the company's decision, saying it represented a commitment to free speech. Facebook's position was that the Trump messages did not violate its community standards, the report said. But the auditors said they strongly disagreed, claiming the messages clearly violated Facebook's policies. The report said Facebook's unwillingness to act seemed to reflect a statement of values that protecting free expression is more important than other stated company values. Facebook's chief operating officer, Sheryl Sandberg, described the audit as a really important process for our company. She said in a statement, the auditors had looked at a wide range of civil rights issues, including our policies against hate. We have made real progress over the years, but this work is never finished, Sandberg said. There are no quick fixes to these issues, nor should there be. What has become increasingly clear is that we have a long way to go.
Australia says it is suspending its extradition treaty with Hong Kong after China began enforcing a new national security law there. To extradite means to send a person who has been accused of a crime to another state or country for trial. Prime Minister Scott Morrison told reporters the new law, which took effect last week, marked a fundamental change that led Australia to suspend the agreement. Morrison also announced the country would extend temporary visas for an additional five years for ten thousand Hong Kong citizens currently studying and working in Australia. After five years, the visa holders would be able to seek permission to live in the country permanently. Australia has always been a very welcoming country to such people, Morrison said. Acting Immigration Minister Alan Tudge said the number of Hong Kongers expected to seek to come to Australia under the new rules would only be in the hundreds or low thousands. Morrison also announced Australia will launch measures aimed at getting Hong Kong businesses to move operations to Australia. The Chinese-backed security law for Hong Kong makes it easier to punish protesters and reduces the city's self-rule powers. It punishes acts of separatism, terrorism. And aiding foreign forces, the new law came after massive and often violent pro-democracy demonstrations in Hong Kong over the past year. Under it, police have new powers to do searches without seeking legal permission. They can also order internet service providers and companies. To remove online messages seen as violations of the legislation, Western governments and human rights activists say the national security law effectively ends the one country, two systems policy. Under that rule, Hong Kong is guaranteed the right to its own social, legal. And political systems for 50 years following the end of British rule in 1997. The Chinese embassy in Canberra issued a statement warning Australia to stop interfering in the affairs of Hong Kong and China. Otherwise, it will lead to nothing but lifting a rock, only to hit its own feet. The statement said. In Beijing, a foreign ministry spokesman said China could decide to take further actions to answer Australia's moves. Australia also issued a new travel advisory for Hong Kong, where about 100,000 Australians live and work. The advisory warns citizens. They may be at risk of detention on vaguely defined national security grounds in Hong Kong. Other Western governments have taken similar steps in reaction to the national security law. Canada also suspended its extradition treaty with Hong Kong. Britain has offered to permit up to three million Hong Kongers to permanently live in Britain, if they are eligible for British national overseas passports. Australia's opposition to the national security law added to existing tensions with China, the country's biggest trading partner. Chinese officials were angered at Australia's demand. For an international investigation 
into how the coronavirus pandemic started. The virus was first recognized last year in the Chinese city of Wuhan. I'm Brian Lin. Intonation is like the music of a language. Intonation means the changes that someone makes to the sound of their voice when speaking. The up and down movements in the voice can show meaning or emotion. These movements can also take the place of punctuation, such as commas or question marks. Today on Everyday Grammar, we will explore the subject of intonation. By using humor, we will show you how one comedian used intonation in ways that can teach you about American English and grammar. The term "rising intonation" means the upward movement of the voice, often at the end of a sentence. In general, Americans use rising intonation in what we call. Yes/no questions, questions that ask for either a yes or no answer. In some cases, these yes/no questions use auxiliary verbs such as can or do, as in this example. Do you know him? One important point in everyday or casual speech. Americans sometimes drop off or leave out the auxiliary verb do, as in. Do you know him? You know him? Did you hear how the voice went up toward the end of the question? That is rising intonation. Let's listen to part of a performance by the American comedian Dave Chappelle. Note how he uses rising intonation. At the end of his yes/no questions, one quick note: Chappelle is mispronouncing the name of American actor Jesse Smollett on purpose. He refers to Smollett as Juicy Sommelier. Don't ever forget what happened to that French actor. You know what I'm talking about? Juicy Sommelier. Note that Chappelle's voice rose after the second line. You know what I'm talking about? This is a yes/no question that left out the auxiliary verb do. The first line, a statement, has the opposite kind of intonation, falling intonation. Don't ever forget what happened to that French actor. Let's listen to more from Chappelle's performance. Juicy Smollett is a very French, very famous French actor. <laughs> Y'all never heard of Juicy Smollett? In this yes/no question, Chappelle turns a statement into a question by changing the intonation of his voice. He also uses the informal structure "y'all," which means. You all. Here is Chappelle's question. Y'all never heard of Juicy Smollett? <laughs> This is how Chappelle's words would sound if they were presented as a statement. You have never heard of Jesse Smollett. You might be asking yourself about other kinds of questions. For example, questions that are not yes/no questions. Such questions often have interrogatives, words such as what, why, when, or how. Questions with interrogative words generally have falling intonation, the opposite of yes/no questions. So, for example, if a person asked about who Dave Chappelle was making fun of, their question might sound like this. Who is Jesse Smollett? Or they might ask, "What is Dave Chappelle talking about?" The main idea of this story is that intonation plays an important role in showing meaning. The next time you are listening to the news or watching a comedy show, 
Ask yourself how the speaker is using intonation. Note the different kinds of intonation you hear, rising or falling. Over time, you will begin to use intonation to show differences in meaning between statements, yes-no questions, and other kinds of questions. I'm John Russell. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Andrew Johnson. Johnson was vice president under Abraham Lincoln and became president in 1865 after Lincoln was killed. His name sounds like that of an earlier president, Andrew Jackson, and also like a later president, Lyndon Johnson. But Andrew Johnson served in the years just after the Civil War. You can remember Johnson this way. He was the first U.S. president to be impeached. Andrew Johnson grew up in a poor family in the southern state of North Carolina. As a child, Johnson had little formal education. Instead, he trained to be a tailor. When he was a young man, Johnson moved to Tennessee, another southern state. He opened a tailoring business, where he made, repaired, and sold clothing. When he was 18 years old, he married. His wife, Eliza McArdle was only 16. They went on to have five children together. Eliza McArdle Johnson did not come from a wealthy family either, but she was better educated than her husband, and she helped him develop his reading and writing skills. She also supported his gift for public speaking. Johnson's speeches were especially popular with workers in their community. They liked his criticism of the state's wealthy planters. The workers also liked his politics. At the time, Johnson supported measures that permitted slavery to expand across the country. He was clear in his speeches that he did not support equality between whites and and African Americans, whether enslaved or free. In time, Johnson held many political offices, mayor, Tennessee's governor, state legislator, and member of the U.S. House of Representatives. When the Civil War began, he was a member of the U.S. Senate. Although he was a Southerner, he did not believe the southern states had a right to withdraw from the Union. When the other southern senators resigned from the U.S. Congress, Johnson stayed. As a result, most southerners considered him a traitor, but most northerners considered him a hero. By 1864, the American Civil War was three years old. The conflict was becoming increasingly fierce and bloody. That year, the states that remained in the Union held their presidential election. The president, Abraham Lincoln, wanted to win re-election and continue directing the Union's war effort but he was not sure that voters in the opposition Democratic Party would support him. So he turned to Andrew Johnson to be his choice for vice president. Johnson was a pro-slavery Democrat. Lincoln was an anti-slavery Republican. In the U.S. tradition, presidential candidates do not usually choose someone from a different party to serve as vice president. 
But in this case, Lincoln's Republicans did. They called the Lincoln-Johnson Partnership the National Union Party. Political leaders hoped Johnson would appeal to Democrats who supported the war effort, to workers, and to small farmers. The plan, along with several military successes for the Union, helped carry the National Union Party to victory. The swearing-in ceremony the following March, however, suggested some of the difficulties ahead. Johnson was sick. To feel better, he had a lot of alcoholic drinks the night before the ceremony. The next morning, he drank some more. When Johnson stood to give his speech, he appeared unsteady. He talked about his poor family and his simple beginnings. Then he spoke angrily about wealthy southern planters who had withdrawn from the Union. He became increasingly confused. Other people in the crowd wrote later that they felt embarrassed by Johnson's behavior, and some Republicans began calling already for his resignation, or even impeachment. Those critics could not have predicted that in a few weeks, Johnson would be the president. A few very important events happened in the weeks after Lincoln and Johnson were sworn in. In April, Lincoln was shot and killed. Johnson took office as the new president. The following month, the Civil War officially ended. The Confederate States of America was no more. And that December a majority of states approved the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. That amendment ended slavery across the country. President Johnson, therefore, guided the process of reuniting the North and South and supervised the transition of many African Americans from slavery to freedom. That period in U.S. history is called Reconstruction. Members of Congress from the northern states had been thinking for a long time about how to carry out Reconstruction. The most extreme lawmakers, the radical Republicans, wanted to punish former Confederate officials and extend political and civil rights to African Americans. Johnson had different ideas. In the first months of his presidency, before Congress had met, Johnson pardoned many former Confederate officials. He also let Southerners rebuild their state governments as they wished. Those governments quickly passed laws called Black Codes. Black Codes restricted the freedom and rights of African Americans. They permitted white landowners to control African Americans' labor, much as they had when the workers were slaves. The laws were enforced by all-white police and militia. Radical Republicans in Congress, as well as African Americans, objected strongly to the Black Codes. When Congress finally did meet, Republican lawmakers voted for a measure to help and protect formerly enslaved people. But Johnson vetoed the measure. He said the bill would give the federal government too much power. Johnson's veto was one move in a political war between the president and many Republicans. In time, lawmakers got the upper hand. The Republican Congress soon took control of Reconstruction. Against Johnson's wishes, they succeeded in passing several major pieces of legislation. 
One was the Civil Rights Act of 1866. It recognized that everyone born in the United States, including African Americans, although not Native Americans, was a citizen. Another was the extension of the Freedmen's Bureau Act, the measure that Johnson had earlier vetoed. For two more years, the federal government was authorized to help people displaced by the Civil War. Finally, lawmakers passed a measure barring the president from dismissing any top officials without the approval of Congress. President Johnson ignored the measure. When he believed the Secretary of War did not treat him respectfully, the president ordered that man's dismissal. In answer, members of the U.S. House of Representatives voted to impeach Johnson. In other words, they charged him with a crime. It was the first time in U.S. history that a president has been impeached. But impeached does not always mean removed from office. The case moves to the Senate. There, senators act as a jury. They decide whether the president is guilty. Two-thirds of the Senate must agree to convict the president. In the case of Andrew Johnson, 54 senators considered his case. For him to be removed from office, 20 would need to find him guilty. But only 19 did. His position was saved by a single vote. Although Johnson survived impeachment, he was not nominated as a candidate for president in the next election. Instead, he returned to his home in Tennessee, then competed for a seat back in Congress. On the third try, he succeeded. Johnson is the first, and only, so far, former president to serve as a senator. He did not stay in the position long, however. A few months after returning to Congress, Johnson died suddenly after suffering a stroke. He was 66 years old. Today, historians have mixed feelings about his presidency. Johnson's supporters approve of his limits on the federal government and belief in a firm separation of powers among Congress, the President, and Supreme Court. But most historians believe Johnson's Reconstruction policies were extremely damaging. They did not help reunite the North and South, and they extended the suffering of African Americans and the country's history of racial oppression. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 